in the latter part of September, you'd have heard us speaking about the Jewish New Year, Rosh Hashanah, and the new season that had actually commenced. And so this morning, there are many of us in the room that have transitioned. There are some of us that are transitioning in the season, and there are some of us that are resistant to the transition. <clears throat> transition means that we are in the in-between stages of what God is doing in us. I like to describe it or allude to it as the hallway or the passageway in a house. When you leave one room and on your way to the next room in your house, it's leaving the old season and en route to the new season, all the promises, all the promise that God has for you. It's leaving the old, but, have, but we haven't yet entered into the new that God has told us about. The hallway is not really a nice place, but it's a necessary place. It's the place of process or the place of metamorphosis for some. It's a place of preparation. These past few weeks have been crucial to the part of preparation and the part of processing us. You see, God is more concerned about you being aligned to him than the assignment he has for you. Or you often heard from this pulpit, alignment is more important than the assignment. Because the heart is a vital part to good spiritual health. <clears throat> I'm going to share a little bit about my transition. I'm currently in transition. And let me tell you, it hasn't been easy. It commenced a few months back when the new year had began and I knew God was going to do something new. And I started to sense the grace lifting of a particular area in my life that I was holding on to quite tight. I didn't realize that perhaps part of it actually defined my success or who I was. And, um, but as I was going about doing this area, I found that I started to lose my joy in doing it. The grace was lifting, but I was still toiling. I was still doing it. It became a little hard, but I was still pushing to do it. But at the same time as I was doing that, I know God was starting to do something else with us in the house and with me personally. <clears throat> and the area that I was talking about was the area of business. Before we started ministry, um, we had begun a business, uh, Creative Edge and the Gift Express, and that was actually our source of income. And when we began the church, we made a commitment that Ash wouldn't take a salary for the first year so that we could start the work and not put a pressure onto um, the house. And that's what we uh, honored. But I was still very much busy in the business itself, and it was actually my source of income. And so when the new season began, or the transition to that, I started finding it difficult to do business. I don't really have a zeal to do it. When I'd get an order, it would take so much longer. I lacked the creativity that I normally have, the joy in it. And I was like, what's happening here? Come on, get yourself together. You know, you need to make this happen, you know. Uh, start looking at different ideas, how you can get the business going and start getting sales and Christmas is coming. And, and I just was not finding the passion. And I'll get an order here and an order there. And when I'm doing it, it's like actually in the way of what else I need to do. And I was like, the grace is lifting. And I know the grace is lifting, but I'm still pushing. I'm like, no, man, it's me, it's me. But actually what God was starting to do, God was starting to align me into the new season that he has 
for, for me and for us as a couple and for the house, the new things that he was starting to bring. And I knew there were things that God wanted to expand in the house and things that he wanted to do, responsibilities he wanted to bring me in. But for me, they were like probably 23, the latter part of 23, maybe 24, you know, in that horizon. Not anything like in the now. And as we started to speak to Pastor Nick then, and just about, you know, what we sensed God was wanting to do and expand the house into, the wheels started turning a bit faster than I expected. (laughs) And they were like, okay, let's, you know, let's start looking at Club Pure. Let's start looking at uh, what God is saying. And, 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 and you heard him speak about that. And the wheels started to move faster. And they were like, okay, guys, we're going to start doing this next year. I'm like, what? Next year? And we're going to be here in October. And start thinking, what's the business strategy? How are you going to do this? And, what? and I was like, what? I'm not ready for this. How am I going to do business, pastor, mother, Add another uh, uh, phase to the church, and we're still growing this church. I'm like, I'm not going to be able to do this. I can't do this. But in the meanwhile, I know in the back of my mind and deep in my spirit, God is saying, you need to let go of the business, and you need to shift totally into the house, into what God has for in the season. And it was hard. It is still hard because that was my source of income. That was a part of me was defined by the success of that. And a few weeks back, I had to start releasing the reins. And I really love and appreciate my husband. He is solid in the word. But sometimes I do get annoyed with him because he doesn't allow me to have that pity party that I need to have. And this week, I think it was Thursday or so, he sat down with me. I mean, I was here, we were praying, and um, I kind of had that look in my eye like, uh, you know when God is saying that you need to like totally let go of something, and you're like, uh, no, 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 not, can I just have a little bit, please? Just a few months, Christmas is now, that's some good cha-ching, you know. And... Um, He looked at me and he's like, are you not ready yet? (laughs) Come on. You need to shift. But amidst that, he brought all the scriptures. And that's how his kind of rebuke is to me, is the word of God. And I'm like, can I just enjoy this moment of my pity party, please? And he's like, you got to shift. The time is now. And I finally decided at the end of that conversation and through the latter part of the week to let go and to be fully committed and have the faith that I need for the season ahead because what God is doing is greater than what I can do in my natural toiling. And what I'm looking at is the natural of what I can provide but what God is about to do is bigger than what I can provide. And have you heard that saying? You busy trying to do your half loaf of bread <laughs> and bring that half loaf and God wants to give you so much more. And I've sensed that is what I was doing. But in, that, in this process of transition, God had to take layers of me. God had to start do, dealing with my insecurity. Was I fully in faith to trust him to be Jehovah Jireh in my life? Was I still looking to the gifts that I had the creativity that I had, the business skills that I had? Or was I looking to God to actually be my provider and trust that everything he tells us to do and put our hands to do will be totally successful for his glory? And that it wasn't about the money. It was about the souls. It was the impact that we were going to have as a church. And so I'm talking this morning about transition because I'm in that phase right now. And some of you are in that process And it's ugly. And it feels like, my God, this is so uncomfortable because I left the season of comfort. And I'm not really in the place of all that God has said, the promised land of it. But God is doing something in me. Because God had to build faith in me. And he's building that faith in me. He's doing that stuff in me for what we are stepping into. And so I want to encourage you today, wherever you find yourself in, 
God is with you. Let him process you for the season ahead. Amen? Well, this morning, that's not my sermon yet. My sermon this morning is titled, The Storm Within. And my key scripture reading is from Mark 4, verses 35 through to 41. And it's from the Amplified Version. That's the louder version for you, if you know. No, I'm kidding. Okay, it's just a little bit more. Um, uh, they just kind of break it down a little bit more. So let's read from Mark 4, verses 35 through to 41. On the same day when evening had come, he said to them, Let us go over to the other side of the Sea of Galilee. Leaving the crowd, they took him with them, just as he was in the boat. And other boats were with him. And a fierce windstorm began to blow, and waves were breaking over the boat, so that it was already being swamped. But Jesus was in the stern, asleep, with his head on the sailor's leather cushion. And they woke him and said to him, Teacher, do you not care that we are about to die? And he got up and sternly rebuked the wind and said to the sea, Hush, be still. And the wind died down as if it had grown weary. And there was at once a great calm, a perfect peacefulness. Jesus said to them, Why are you afraid? Do you still have no faith and confidence in me? They were filled with a great fear and said to each other, Who then is this that even the wind and the sea obey him? Prefacing this, Jesus had spent some time with the crowds sharing some parables about the kingdom of God. He'd also done some incredible miracles of, le- of healing a man with leprosy, healing the servant of the Roman um, soldier. He'd done some really amazing miracles. And then he decides with his disciples to go to the other side of the Sea of Galilee. And some of the disciples that were with him were actually fishermen. And so they're actually very familiar with this mass of water, the Sea of Galilee. The Sea of Galilee was famous for its sudden and severe storms, produced by winds that funneled through the passes and canyons of the surrounding hills that creates severe turbulence in the water. As experienced fishermen, the disciples knew that this was a constant risk that they would face every time they went out on the water. Now remember, they didn't have weather 24 where they could like, you know, tap in and see, hey, this is what the wind is going to be like, what time the storm is going to come, or is it sound, what time is going to be sunrise or sunshine. They had to kind of look around and say, okay, look at the clouds, how does it feel? What does it, does it feel windy? And, and kind of from the elements around side, whether, okay, is there going to be a storm ahead or when is it going to approximate break on us? Now, remember that they were going to face a storm. They didn't have an idea when the storm would be. So can you picture this with me? The disciples were on the boat, having probably a good hearty chat, talking about the miracles that they saw Jesus do, or maybe even talking about the parables that they heard and trying to make sense of it. And the storm starts, probably looking at the clouds and like, guys, it's getting darker here. There's going to be a storm coming. Maybe they can sense it on the boat, a little bit of a sway happening. And they thought to themselves, well, we could deal with this. We used to storms. You know, we got this. It's going to happen, but we'll be okay. And remember, it was a storm, not a tsunami. So a storm brews. And there were no signs of the storm when they left. But whilst they were on the water, the water started to get rough, and the boat started to sway. The storm started while they were away from land and on the sea. But as the waves grew higher, they grew more fearful and started to panic. Because now the water was not just battering against the boat, but it was actually starting to get inside, which could mean 
that they could soon start to sink. And in that moment of panic, in that moment of fear, in that moment of uncertainty, they run to Jesus. And this is what they say in Mark 4.38. Jesus was, and this is what the verse says, Jesus was sleeping at the back of the boat with his head on a cushion. The disciples then woke him up, shouting, Teacher, don't you care that we're going to drown? See, we all will face the storms of life. Whatever that storm may be, the storm of a loss of a loved one, the loss of a job, maybe a failed marriage, maybe a prodigal kid, whatever that storm may be, maybe a loss of employment, whatever that storm may be, we will all find ourselves facing some storm in life. Because storms are inevitable. John 16.33 says this, I have told you all this so that you may have peace in me. Here on earth, you will have many trials and sorrows. But take heart, because I have overcome the world. Jesus is already telling us, guys, we are going to have storms. We're going to have stuff that happens to us. But note, he is with us. Note that there is a peace. Note that there is a victory that we will have in the midst of all the storms that we would face. But how many of us have reacted like the disciples did, where they said, teacher, don't you care that we're going to drown? Haven't you said, God, don't you care what's happening to me? God, how can this happen to me right now? How can I be facing the storm? God, how can you take this loved one away? God, how can you allow me to be out of a job? Lord, how can you allow this financial situation? God, how can I go through the storm? God, have you not forgotten about me. Come on, how many of us can attest to responding just like the disciples do? I don't think the men on the boat got scared of the storm because they were familiar to storms as fishermen. It was when the water, it was when the storm waters actually got inside the boat that the danger started to arise. See, in life, we will always have storms around us. But it's when the storm gets on the inside of us when we are really in trouble. It's when we start to feel like we are drowning. When we feel like we've lost our way. When we feel that we are out of balance in life. When we feel that God seems so far away. When we feel that His voice is so faint. Then the storm around us causes a storm within us. The storm of fear, the storm of doubt, the storm of anxiety, the storm of uncertainty, the storm of depression, the lack of identity, secrecy, shame, and guilt. The host of all those emotions cause us to lose sight of the promises of God. The promise of victory, the promise of peace, the promise that he will always be with us. Let's pick up on verse 39. And this is Jesus' response to the disciples. When Jesus woke up, he rebuked the wind and said to the waves, Silence, be still. And suddenly the wind stopped and there was a great calm. Jesus displayed the power of the spoken word. He spoke to the storm. And just like Jesus spoke to the storm, he has given us the ability to speak to our storms, to silence the storms around us and to silence the storms within us. Jesus knew what was happening around him, but yet he chose to rest, even though the storm was happening around us. The rest within him overpowered the storm around him. Hebrews 6 verses 18 through to 19 says, So God has given us both this, his promise and his oath. These two things are unchangeable because it is impossible for God to lie. 
Therefore, we who have fled to him for refuge can have a great confidence as we hold to the hope that lies before us. This hope is a strong and trustworthy anchor for our souls. It leads us through the curtain into God's inner sanctuary. There's an anchor for our soul. There's an anchor for us in the midst of the storms of life. When we face the storms, we have an anchor that we can hold on to. It's an anchor in Him. It's an anchor in Jesus. Psalms 107 verses 28 to 32 says, Lord, help, they cried in their trouble, and He saved them from their distress. He calmed the storm to a whisper and stilled the waves. What a blessing was that stillness as he brought them safely into harbor. Let them praise the Lord for his great love and for the wonderful things he has done for them. Let them exalt him publicly before the congregation and before the leaders of the nation. Psalm 46 verses 1 to 3. God is our refuge and strength, always ready to help us in times of trouble. So we will not fear when earthquakes come and the mountains crumble into the sea. Let the oceans roar and foam. Let the mountains tremble as the waters surge. After Jesus calms the storm around them, he calms the storm within them. He first speaks to the storm and says, be still. But he then says to them in Mark 4.40, Why are you so fearful? How is it that you have no faith? He started to speak to the storm of fear that was starting to rage within them. The fear, the, the doubt, the lack of faith that was the turmoil in them. The, because faith and fear can't abide together. You can't say, I'm in faith, and yet be fearful of what, is, what the future holds. Did they not think that because he was with them, speaking of Jesus here, that he would take them safely across? Did they not remember that he will never forsake them? The concluding response from the disciples show us that amidst them walking with Jesus, hearing the parables that he shared, the truth that he shared, the prophecies that he spoke about, the miracles that he did, they still lacked a revelation of who was in the boat with them. They still lacked the revelation of, the, of who Jesus was. They still were limited in the revelation of who was with them and who was doing life with them, but also who was in their midst. The Sea of Galilee is actually relatively a shallow mass of water. They say it's roughly about 200 feet, like 60 meters in depth. And this one commentary said, a shallow lake is whipped up by wind more rapidly than deep water, where energy is more readily absorbed. And this is what I want to draw from that. Because the water was shallow, when the wind hits it, it's so easy, it's so quick for that wave and that surge to actually happen and the storms to become more fierce. But when there's deep water, when there is depth, it doesn't happen so easily because of the depth of the water actually consumes the energy that the wind carries. What's the depth that you carry this morning? What's the depth of the revelation of who Christ is? What's the depth of the word that you carry? What's the depth of your relationship in him? So when the winds of life and the storms start to hit, what speed will it take you at? How quick will you get into the eye of the storm? What's the depth? What's the mass that you are carrying in him? Is it shallow? Is it deep waters? Is there a depth of revelation? How deep is your relationship this morning with God?
We will all face storms. It's inevitable, as I had mentioned. But what we got to watch out for is not to let the waters of the storm, the storm itself, to get in us. Because when you have a storm within you, and you're still trying to fight the storm around you, it's almost impossible. But when you are able to bring peace to the storm within you, and rest in the promises of God, you can fight the storms around you more successfully. See, this Christmas... Let it be a different Christmas. When we get to Christmas, and I know we all, we, we, we love Christmas, and there's the gifts and the, the food and all the great celebrations that will happen. And we hear the nativity story about the birth of Christ. But may this Christmas go beyond the meaning of just the birth of Christ. May it have a greater meaning of the birth of your peace, the birth of your hope, the birth of your steadfastness, the birth of, of, of your joy, of everything that you need, the anchor of your soul for what you will live out in the year ahead, in the life that you have. More than just what you see in the stable, more than just what you read in the nativity or you see a drama. It's the birth of the hope the Son of God, the birth of your peace and your joy in the midst of the storms you will face. This morning, I'm going to play a short audio clip that I'm going to get the production guys to play. I'm going to ask you to take the next five to six minutes. And as I was preparing for this, I came across this clip from one of my favorite preachers. And I believe she just puts this so well in concludes what I wanted to share uh, so powerfully. So will you just turn your attention, maybe you need to close your eyes and just remove the distractions and just zone into this clip this morning. Thanks, guys. Uninvited, yet it still arrives. Unapologetic, in the wake of all it will disturb. Its presence seeks an audience. Its power strives to be seen, and its noise demands to be heard. Look at me, it shouts. Be afraid of what damage I may do. Watch as my wind howls break in anything that seeks to stand in its way. This storm intrudes, invades, interrupts. It is void of care. It has no intention of cleaning up any of its devastation. The storm we see in the natural is only rivaled by the storm that is sent in the spiritual. This storm also roars, but its prey is far more sinister. This storm, the storm of life, feeds off our fears and seeks to destroy our destinies. These storms are assignments of darkness to bring adversity and cause upheaval, to disorient and confuse, to kill, steal and destroy the storms of challenge and conflict, the violent winds of pain and hardship, storms that threaten relationships and play on insecurities. No one is immune from the storms of life, from the bad news, the testing times, loss and abuse, from the betrayal, disappointment, anxiety or torment. We all have storms, but when did we forget that we all have a voice. You have the words to silence the winds. You have the confession to calm the confusion. You have the light to illuminate the dark. Your storm may be on the horizon, 
or you may be in its eye. But no matter where this finds you, you must find your voice. Find your song and sing. Find your promise and persist. Find your faith and fight. Find your voice and speak to the storm. There was a time when Jesus and the disciples found their situation suddenly change. Remember the story when they were in a storm. The storm ripped through the calm and it began to rage. Out of nowhere, the simple boat journey became the most testing trial. The wind blew and the waves grew. The storm threw some into panic. They allowed fear to speak and lost sight of the fight. Others, they couldn't see a way out and so began to entertain doubt. Yet, there was one. There was one that was asleep, asleep in the storm. It did its best to disturb him, but he slept. Woken by those who had let fear take a hold, Jesus spoke. To the storm, he said, be still. To the chaos, he spoke calm. To the fearful, he spoke faith. And to the dark, he brought light. Jesus spoke, and the storm surrendered. You have the same power to bring order, and you have the words to advance and take on the warfare. Don't allow your voice to be silenced by the storm. Wake up, worship, declare his goodness, sing of his faithfulness, speak his peace, and wage war with the words of life. The greatest miracles can happen in the storm. The miracles of our awakening to the power that is so often dormant within. Miracles happen when we speak to the storm, when we answer back to its threat with boldness and trust. Miracles are found when the word is spoken out loud, drowning out the lies with the declaration of truth. The miracle is in your mouth. The storm cannot withstand the weapon of worship and the arsenal of prayer. We all have storms, but we all have a voice. So speak to the storm. So sing. Sing until you see the still. Praise. Praise until the promise comes. Believe. Believe until the breakthrough. Declare. Declare until the dawn has come. And fight. Fight with faith until all the fear is gone. Find your voice. Choose your song. We all have storms. But we all have a voice. So speak. Speak. Speak to the storm. In 2010, I'd come back to South Africa in 2009, 2010, my dad got diagnosed with cancer. Um, it was a tumor on his liver. And uh, he started chemotherapy, and it was stage four. And uh, he was doing quite well. And, you know, uh, there was quite optimistic reports coming through. And uh, it was about 2012 that um, he decided that um, he would start to pursue going into um, getting an operation done on the tumor. And um, we said, well, everybody's saying you can't do this because the amount of liver that would have to be cut out and but somehow there was a specialist, a surgeon that convinced him that this will be fine and he could go ahead and do it and it'll be all okay. And so uh, it was happening in Durban. And so that Sunday we had a service at church. It was a celebration. And that afternoon we drove him to a uh, hospital in Durban. And Monday morning he was going to have the procedure. And um, 
they painted this great picture that everything was going to be well. My dad looked convinced, and we were like, okay, well, this is what you feel that you need to do. Said, okay, bye. Checked him in to his room, said bye, walked away. The next morning, um, call in, see how the operation is going. Okay, the operation is done, but he's in ICU and, um, you know, post-op type of thing. Great, that's fine. Um, get to go see him in the afternoon and um, all is looking well. The op seems to have do done well. The next morning they call and said, um, there's quite a bit of bleeding happening. Um, a few hours later, okay, there seems to be infection entering. We're going to have to put him onto life support. Um, the following day, I didn't get to go, um, but he had improved. My brother and my mom visited him. Uh, that day I was the first day that I said, okay, I sent my brother to him. I said, no, I'm, I've got a meeting. Can you go? And that was the day they allowed my dad to actually take his mask off and actually speak. And so he got to hear him. And um, then they put it back. The next day they said to us, um, it's not looking good. And by Friday morning, they had confirmed that he had entered into multiple organ failure. And that's when my storm of life began in a space of 24 hours. I got to the hospital, and for the first time, I felt totally helpless. We were in Durban. I didn't know any of the doctors. You're in a hospital that you have no idea. At least here in these hospitals, you kind of know a lot of people. The surgeon refused to attend to my dad. I think he had realized he had messed up. The only person that was willing to help me was the anesthesist, and they limited in their knowledge and what they could do. Um, and all I was getting was just bad reports, nothing good. And I'm sitting with my mom. My sister's here in Marisburg. My brother's in Marisburg. Nobody could help us. Nobody had answers for us. Nobody could say anything medically. They just were saying, it's not looking good. And all I could do was pray, and all I could do was hold on to God, and all I could do was at that moment saying, God, I need you. I don't understand what's happening. I'd love to say I had this great prayer. I think I just had one. God, I need you. I need you to help me. I need you to tell me what to do. You need to give me favor. You need to show me what to do. And that's when the anesthesist was willing to actually come alongside and help explain what was going on here. Long story short, the next morning, they called, and I shared this with our walking group. Um, they called like about 6 in the morning saying, it's not looking good. Your, your dad has um, probably an hour or two um, make your way here to Durban. So try to rally everybody, get ourselves ready. Within an hour, we got a call. The nurse said, um, my name is so-and-so. I just want to tell you I'm a Christian. Um, I anointed your dad. I prayed with him. I gave him communion. And um, he's gone to be with the Lord. And it's peaceful. And my, the beginning of a storm happened on Friday. And I hit the eye of the storm on Saturday. Because out of nowhere, I'd learned my dad had passed on with having no idea what that actually meant. Because we had, he had a business, he had all these other things going on. My mom was older, she's never paid an account, she doesn't know, she has no bank account, she has no idea of doing any of these things. My dad has been the one that's done all this, and all the weight of this responsibility just started to happen on me within hours and days. And I actually didn't know what to do. I started to find myself feeling like I was drowning in the decisions that I had to make, in the funeral plans that had arrangements that had to be made. What was going to happen to the business? I had no idea. I'd been away for 10 years. I didn't know what my dad owned. I didn't even know if my dad had a will. And all the different things that happened with the loss of a loved one that you didn't anticipate. Yes, my dad had cancer, but... We still know that was a journey, you know. We still believing and trusting God for a miracle. But this suddenly was not on the horizon. It was not on my plan. It was not on my timeline that I saw. But I was faced 
with the storm. And I thank God that I had some boats around me that were anchored and were steady, that knew the Word of God, that knew how to pray, that knew how to encourage, that helped me along, that prayed for me and shared me and showed me and did some practical things around me, helped me to make some plans. But I can tell you this. When I was anch- because I was anchored in who God was, I looked back at how God brought me through, and I knew what the Word of God said. I started to recall the Scriptures, and I started to recall the promises, and I started to recall the character of God. And that helped to calm the storm within me so I can face the storm around me that was he- hitting me and my family. And out of every one of us three, we're all in different journeys of our faith. My brother's not a believer. My mom is, 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 is a Jehovah's Witness. My sister was still finding it in her faith, but not at the level that she needed to be to face the storm that we had. And I had to rise up in that moment and trust the wisdom that God could give me to navigate me and my family through this. So I stand here not saying to say this is a nice thing and here's the five point win of how you do it. <laughs> I'm standing here to say I've had to navigate through some storms in life. I had not to navigate one earlier this year. And I'm telling you, it was so painful. And as I'm navigating the storms with other people in the church, <laughs> I had to navigate the storm within me of a promise that I couldn't hold on to anymore. And God, 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 His Word, worship, prayer, like Charlotte said, run to worship, run to your prayer closet, stay prostrate before God. There's something about worship. There's something about praise. There's something about looking at the scripture and going back. If you don't know what scripture, go to the back of the Bible, the concordance, and look for fear and find the scriptures. Look for anxiety and find the scriptures and look and take them as promises and say, God, you said it. This is me. This is what it says to me, God. Come on this morning, whatever that storm is within you, that's raging within you this morning, I want to say, peace, be still. You have the power in your mouth to say, peace, be still, to the storms around you, around your family.